What's going on, Hot Take Nation? It is DRW here. A little preamble before this week's episode with Jack Hamlin of Energy Strong. There are some air quality hearings coming up uh, September 17th and 18th, which you can sign up for online. And it's extremely important that our voice gets heard. And, and Jack talks a lot about this on the episode. And really the purpose of Energy Strong is a grassroots advocacy of uh, educating the public about the benefits and the safety of oil and gas development. Uh, 65,000 members strong. They're, they have a great mission and, and the purpose is just to get our industry and our employees and our people involved because it's not enough to sit on the sidelines. We've sat on the sidelines for too long and as a result, we've seen regulation after regulation, proposition after proposition. And even when a proposition like Proposition 112 was shut down in Colorado, it was immediately replaced in, this, in a snowstorm and passed SB 181, which changed the mandate of the COGCC, changed the rulemaking, and as they've gone through that process, they're now discussing the exact same setbacks that voters voted down. And so there's lots of ways to get involved, but right now, Energy Strong and Hot Take of the Day are asking you, if you are a Colorado resident, please, please, please sign up for the September 17th and the September 18th air quality hearings and let your voice be heard about how important this industry is to Colorado, to the tax base, to schools, and to providing clean, affordable energy to heat our homes, to drive our cars, and to encourage investment in this state rather than have that investment leave. It's a critical, critical issue, and Jack and I talk about it a lot on this issue, on this uh, episode. I hope you enjoy it. As always, you can reach out to me with your thoughts, comments, concerns, and just chat your mind so that you can get prepared for this air quality hearing on September 17th and 18th. I appreciate you. If you like what we're doing, subscribe. Until next time, be safe, be good. Have a great day, and bye for now. What is going on, Hot Take Nation? It is DRW here for another episode of the Hot Take of the Day podcast. Uh, I am joined today by Jack Hamlin, who has uh, a lot to cover. We got Energy Strong. We got mergers of your former engineering firm that you were the president of, Summit Engineering. Um, first of all, how are you doing? How are you surviving COVID? Things going okay? Yeah, yeah. All things considered, uh, frustrated like most people. Um a lot of a lot of things don't make sense in terms of mandates and policy, but um, kind of dance between the raindrops and get through it best we can. Got Good. A, uh, a motorcycle and a boat, and those have been kind of my salvation this year. There you go. I've been hitting the golf course a lot, and as yeah. have I mean, if you think about golf, the resurgence, like the '80s when they were doing nothing but building golf courses in communities. I mean, every tee sheet golf has experienced this unbelievable resurgence of people picking it up or you know, finding it because it's a great social distancing. I'm sure motorcycling and boat, boating is the same. How packed are the roads of motorcycles and, and the lakes of boats these days? Uh, pretty pretty busy, a lot busier than they used to be. We used to leave for like an overnight trip to Aspen or, or uh, Vail or something on a Thursday afternoon to beat traffic, just get done with work at about noon and get out of here. And we do that now and it's like, you know, weekend traffic starting on Wednesday. Uh, the boats, like Chatfield's where my boat's at and it's, they, uh, they reach capacity by like nine in the morning on the weekend. So if you're not on the water by nine, um, you're waiting kind of in a one on one off deal. And, but people are tied up in the no wake zones, having fun and, and just trying to, um, trying to have some sort of like semblance of normal life. It, it, it is crazy. So let's, I don't know where to start. I don't know if we want to start with energy strong or we want to start with, um, the merger that you did with Summit engineering. Why don't you 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 take the mic and you you start where you want to start. Lord have mercy. Okay. Um, well, we'll start with the Energy Strong thing. That that's kind of we'll go chronologically here. Um, Energy Strong was, was kind of founded out of um, a lack in the market that we saw. Oil and gas has always been pretty historically terrible about marketing itself and um, really 
engaging with people that aren't involved in oil and gas to help them understand uh, our industry and, and the products and the services that it provides. So uh, kind of spawned out of Senate Bill 1, uh, or excuse me, Prop 112, the, the setback measure. That's where it spawned out of. Uh, Dustin Case was, was the founder of Energy Strong and recognized that, hey, like, we're losing this, this fight and it's not a lobbying fight. It's not the traditional um, political fight. It's an online social media battle that the oil and gas industry had no idea they were even in. They were running commercials on TV, you know, the typical um, mechanisms to try and get their message out. You know, someone running along a creek saying they love Colorado and why oil and gas was great, but it really didn't put any sort of semblance to what what oil and gas did for the everyday person. So, you know, being on social media, I was on Facebook. I'm not anymore. Just couldn't handle it anymore. But um, yeah, let's say we'll talk about that after this. The, it's yeah, but I mean, everybody knows. I mean, uh, all of a sudden, everybody, everybody became an expert on setbacks and fracking and blah, blah. So we were there to like, there was no place where the oil industry got together. It's very tribal. You have your upstream, your midstream, your downstream field engineering. Everybody's kind of segmented. And you've got these groups like GPA and pipeliners and uh, COGA and API and all that, but nobody really orchestrates or communicates across the industry wavelengths to, to have a unified message. Uh, but our opposition does, and they, they primarily did that through social media. They said this is uh, concerned parents um, on the other side, so people that didn't understand oil and gas, they're concerned. Uh, they don't understand the the facilities, they don't understand how safe a pipeline is, et cetera. They hear the talking points that, you know, oil and gas is uh, polluting and uh, gonna, you know, ruin the climate blah, and, and so forth. So put together uh, Energy Strong and then we got together and formulated a, a, a loose business plan. I'm like, hey, we've got to get to other states and like Colorado's, yeah, in the middle of it. So let's focus here first and then Everybody assumes places like Texas and Wyoming are safe, but they're not, as, as we've seen in some recent uh, um, uh, kind of town hall meetings there. Same same story as here, but yeah, you know, I grew up in Colorado, so I've watched it be really safe for oil and gas to now kind of looking over your shoulder when you talk about it. So we, we got this uh, online group on Facebook primarily going, reached like 40,000 uh, members there, and we're able to, to really, you know, get people out to – Town, so, so now that it's, uh, so, so Prop 112, that, that all went through, right? As we kind of accumulated people, then Senate Bill 181 came right on the heels of that. And that's when it was um, realizing like, hey, we need to get down to the state capitol. We need to go to these town hall meetings. We need to show up at the GO, GOCCC. And that was kind of where Energy Strong spawned. And we've got, it's totally grassroots to combat a grassroots effort against us. Um, and, and we're just trying to educate and advocate for the industry using, you know, kind of what you're doing and what Alex Epstein is doing. It's just trying to use, all well, you guys do a lot better, uh, you know, you guys are really eloquent speakers, but um, trying to just get as much data out there as we can, whether that's through publishing a, a newspaper article or, or getting on Facebook and posting articles, get people aware and, and understanding what's going on. Um, so, so that, tell me, so tell me about the learnings that you've had, because the, the key phrase that I heard that you said was grassroots. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, obviously, the industry, the energy industry in Colorado put, as I understand it, between 25 and 30 million dollars into fighting Prop 112. And Prop 112 comes to an end, which was a significant capital expenditure. Lots of energy and investment was put into that. And immediately on the back of that was 181. And we talk about these grassroots efforts, but, but in your experience, are you finding that these, the, the, the opposition to oil and gas, does that feel grassroots to you? Does it feel like it's just concerned citizens who are building a book and, and putting no. out talking points or, or what, what, what was that experience been like? Yeah, that's been a um, great question. So it's been, um, Really, really frustrating. So there is a component of, of concerned people, I, and I'm not going to try to diminish that. I've engaged people that are that oppose the oil and gas industry at various town hall events and at the state capitol to, to try to understand what what's their purview. Why are they really they drove to the state capitol after all, and it's heated with natural gas to keep us warm from the the storm outside in February. How could they be against something you know so so great? 
and you know their deal was that you know it's in it's in our backyards we see pipes and pumps and process equipment and flares and we don't understand it and it shouldn't be here i mean that so they are concerned and they're concerned about the the kind of gaslighting that goes on around um you know elevated uh emissions or whatever but then yeah there's a very being where i really realized that it was beyond grassroots and really starting to get orchestrated was at the the eerie town hall meeting i worked a full day drove for two hours in traffic up to testify and when i was called up to testify after sitting there for three hours they had shut the meeting down uh literally they called my name to come up they shut the meeting down because the, the protesters all had signs in the windows behind uh saying that oil and gas kills people and they would they were all coughing in concert so you couldn't talk so they just shut the whole meeting down because it got too contentious um, wow. Yeah, I mean, that's, our- that's crazy. I mean, it's crazy to think about that. And again, I don't want to make this necessarily political, but generally Republicans are on the side of oil and gas development. Generally, Democrats are on the side of not oil and gas development. And you don't see Republicans showing up at these hearings coughing. I, and and, no, in and fact, it's, in it's fact, bizarre so to me that we don't want to have dialogue. If I could tell you how frustrating it was, we the oil and gas people that were in that room would sit there, you know, listen to the opposition. I wanted to understand the opposition so I could figure out a good counterpoint or, or, you know, we're engineer. We have an engineering company. We could, uh, we could address the problems they have and solve them using, you know, real practical application instead of just complaining about it and say, we're going to try something totally new. Um, the only one that really, Barbara Kirkmeyer, uh, from Well County has been unbelievably supportive, but we were all sitting there with our hands on our laps waiting. And then when we'd get up to talk, everybody would really harass the heck out of us. And um, you, know, you got to take the high road there. There were no decorum rules. I mean, it was like a free for all. We would all be quiet out of respect and all that. And we would just get yelled at, told, told we're killing families and we don't care about the environment. And um, that, that is that is so fr- I mean it's so frustrating to me because it, it again it harkens to the riots and the protests that that when when yeah, and I'll go back to the beginning of COVID when people were gathering to say these lockdowns are ruining our families and ruining the economy people like dismiss them and they're and they're being horrible people and they have all these rules and then all of a sudden it's a it's a more sensitive topic where woke people if you can call it that are saying well oil and gas development is bad so we allow this behavior that i mean why did the cogcc or whoever was hosting the hearing the town hall why did they not just evict everyone so that's that you can what get we said i mean that's at beyond the state, belief at the, at the state capitol level there was a sergeant at arms where if you so much as whispered while someone else was giving testimony they would take you out of the room and say you've lost your your ability to give testimony so you had to be very quiet there at the cogcc meetings and town halls it wasn't that way and why didn't they i can't answer that question but it's the same i mean those same parallels are drawn when you look at yeah uh the latest thing with nancy pelosi you shut down salons but she can go get her hair cut it was it the rules were seemed to be different and um I don't um, I don't know why I, I wish I could verbalize how frustrated I was because this is stuff that I did on my own time. Yeah. I wasn't getting paid to do it. I was doing it because I believe in the industry and, and I, I believe in domestic energy. It's uh, beyond heating our homes. It's a, it's a huge geopolitical lever. And uh, for our whole lives, we fought for energy independence and every president, including Obama, uh, fought for energy independence. Now all of a sudden it's in vogue to try, you know, to, to, to villainize it. I'm a little more pragmatic than that. And, and um, I, as much as I hate that it's gotten political, my first testimony at the state capitol was basically my first line was energy independence shouldn't be political. We're like, we all depend on it. If there's something better, great, let's pilot it and roll it out. But you don't just, I mean, I run a business. If I was going to adopt a new policy that affected everybody, I wouldn't just roll the thing out and say, figure it out. I would try it with a small subset, make sure I worked out the kinks, and then roll it out. And and what you've got here is typical, you know, government interventions. They're pick, they're picking up the ball and running with it. And now everybody's hyped up into a hysteria. No one will listen to each other. So um, what's what's the solution in your in your mind? I mean, you've you've got this grassroots group that's truly grassroots, and 
you know, is going actively to, to meetings to try and share, is engaging with people, is, is representing what the industry can do. And yet it feels like we're fighting an uphill battle in Colorado. So, um, um, well, I, I don't think we're fighting. Um, I've been at all these town halls. I've been, um, desperately trying to get people from the industry to show up, but no one shows. I mean, we can get, there were times like in, in Commerce City, I went up to that town hall to give testimony and through Energy Strong, we're able to grab like nine or 10 people and then myself. So we had 11 people and we showed, and we were the only ones to show up um, to a meeting that had four people that lived in, in the community that were anti oil and gas. So if we wouldn't have shown up, it would have been four against zero, but we showed up and turned the tables and at that meeting, they effectively put a moratorium on, they, they said, hey, we're not gonna put a moratorium, we're gonna just kick the can down the road a little bit, effectively a victory for oil and gas. Whereas I think right now with local control, if people don't show up, the opposition does, they, they're there every time, they're never not showing up. So one is we need to fight. I don't think we fight at all. You can get, I mean, I'm, I'm on the board of the Rocky Mountain Pipeliners Club. We open a golf tournament that sells out in two minutes. It's 200 golfers. You, you tell, ask somebody to show up on a Zoom call to fight for their, their industry and to say why it's great, and you can't get 10 people to show up. You tell me. Is that a fight? doesn't feel like a fight to me. I mean, that, it's, a great, it's a great point, and, and it, it's, it's amazing that we're, we're fortunate to have citizens like yourself who are fighting for people's jobs and fighting for people's livelihoods. How have you been able to coordinate or communicate with either Koga or let's use – like a large company like Occidental or Chevron now that they've done the Noble. I mean, clearly it's their asset value that's being negatively impacted by these rules. Are they doing things at a different level, at a political level, at a state level that's helping stem the tide versus this, you know, I mean, again, just because 10 people show up, if there's 10 million people or 5 million people in Colorado that it influences, politicians shouldn't be listening to the four that are eight that show up, but they do. So I'm curious how, how that works. Yeah. I mean, what, what I'm observing is they're listening to a vocal minority, which is pretty on par with just about everything else. Um, in my head, I think, uh, great. The market, if, if everybody wants solar panels and wind, you can go to home Depot and, you know, get harassed by the guy to, to sell you solar panels. Everybody should switch or, or even, focus the energy on changing building code for new builds. They have to have X number of solar or wind, but they're not. It's just like abandoning one for another. To answer your question, um, we communicate a little bit with Koga on getting some facts. They have some great data sheets. Um, they're more, more, of a, more of a lobbying group or, or you know, how, however they operate, but it's not grassroots. Um, we haven't really engaged, although almost everybody online and everybody that you know, talks to me through LinkedIn or messages or emails, wonders why, where, where are the CEOs? Where, where's Noble? Where's Extraction? Where's Oxy? Yeah, I agree with that to some point. Um, sure, there, they, I think there's some, a lot behind the scenes during rulemakings where they have their people there to help discuss, but, but where we're engaged is more public comment. I don't think, I mean, I think personally it'd be tremendously powerful if the CEOs came on and talked to the public and said, this is what we're doing. And, we're proud of our safety in here. Instead, you've got the peripheral companies, the support companies, we're engineering, you've got some construction companies out there, you know, other types of uh, fabrication vendors, and they discuss, you know, hey, look, we've got a health and safety department that's on complete overhead. Environment comes, safety environment come first, everything else comes second. That's how we operate our, we're engineering. I think engineering companies have a great story to tell. Yeah. Um, we're the ones that design in the safety factor. Uh, to, er, the environment's considered with every piece of equipment we select. The frustrating part about that, when we go to testimony, I've emailed the owners of every engineering company in, in Colorado and Den in the Denver area that supports oil and gas saying, hey, our people's livelihoods are on the line. Show up, send one or two of them. If everybody sent two, three people, even one person, you've got engineers talking i mean these are people that are educated in this state at the school of mines and cu that are very smart they're they're rooted in science and technology and and will have have this great story to tell what happens zero people showed up you know and i've emailed several times so it's almost like this um i mean people say they'll fight for the industry blah blah now they kind of just stick their head in the stand and hope someone else shows up that's that's what i've seen and I'm really hoping through energy. Energy Strong's done a good job of 
getting people there, but not in the numbers that I would have hoped for. And I don't think anybody else has hoped for. Um, so, so what, how do you, how do you bridge that? I mean, you know, and, and I, I sense your frustration. I hear your frustration because it is frustrating. Like, and again, everything is parallel there. There's, there's this big behemoth that's moving that's been moved by a small amount of data and in fact, not data. And I'll use, again, everyone, you tie COVID because of demand and, and what's just going on in the world. But the CDC just came out after six months where one model not used by the CDC, but predicted 2.2 million Americans would die. In fact, 185,000 have, of which 9,210 were actually the cause of COVID. And the rest were like they had leukemia or, or d diabetes or whatever. And so I'm curious how you bridge the data with the facts, with the building energy strong, with all of it to get, like if you could tell one thing to CEOs right now, what would it be? Get your people involved to tell their story. Uh, oil and gas has an amazing story to tell. I, I got into this industry out of passion. I as a business guy, I filled up my motorcycle, my car, my boat. If I flew somewhere, everything was liquid fuels. I would pump gas into my car in Mexico if I was vacationing after I just flew there and they would fuel the plane up. I'm thinking, gosh, look, this commodity is all over the globe. You can you can put it in your car no matter where you're at, right? How, how did it get here? How did it come out of the earth as a raw material and, and get to where it is? So mine was a natural curiosity. And then once I got into it, most people don't know that, you know, their computers, their phones, their 90% of everything in their house is a synthetic petrochemical. Um, they just turn the heat on a, a testimony. I mean, you had people discussing, um, you know, land based Colorado saying we produce five more, five times as much energy as we need. We don't need all this drilling. And they don't understand like, yeah, we're feeding other states because they're deficient in natural resource. Like right. we, we're saving lives, we're protecting people from the environment. What I would tell CEOs is, is what are you waiting for? You're up again, you're on the ropes here. I mean, financials aside and, and that socially, there's nowhere to go. We're backed into a corner. It's time to fight. If not now, when are you going to do it? Uh, it doesn't make any sense that, that the response has been so lethargic and you've got the small guys out there fighting your fight for you. And I'm happy to do it. I mean, industry has been great for, for me and it's been great for our uh, company and the people in it. Happy to fight for what I believe in. Um, but so should they. And, and I really uh, don't think they understand the fight they're in. They're in a grassroots online fight like that's on next door and Facebook and, and they're running uh, radio commercials. No one listens to the radio. Right. Well, let's let's talk about social media, because I think, you know, you alluded to a point that you're off Facebook now, but but clearly Energy Strong is still coordinating efforts and meetings at Energy Strong. So the, the what's they just connect with you on Facebook. That's that's how they would follow it. And then let's talk about your departure from Facebook and what social media you use. Yeah. So uh, so Energy Strong is across all platforms. So we're on uh, everything except Twitter. So we're on Facebook. That's our biggest presence. Uh, LinkedIn's our second biggest, like 60,000 uh, members there. And then uh, Instagram, which is a little little uh, weaker presence, but we still do it. Um, Facebook for me just became too toxic. It was a cesspool. Um, uh, the, the Energy Strong Facebook page was great. It kept everybody up to date on like, when's the next town hall? here's a new white paper that was published here's what the opposition is saying and, and we moderated it to some we wanted people to vent but we weren't going to allow for any hatred or um tearing down anybody it was about education and advocacy we want people to help so that's obviously the, the easiest one i just couldn't do facebook anymore i woke up i would see stuff that like mike foot uh, you know politicians jason crow diana to get all blasting oil and gas and other social issues and it just made me a worse person i'd wake up completely happy read two two posts on facebook and grumble and go get my coffee and say what what a you know uh, insert whatever words you want so i just life decision i i'm focusing on i only have so much life energy and i'm going to focus it on good stuff so the linkedin stuff is kind of where i focus that's my most prominent platform it's it's mostly professional uh, both from a 
career standpoint and and a discourse standpoint people are actually giving good discourse there um even on the on the flip side yet there's i've seen some of the stuff on on your posts where people challenge you and you have to come back with something that's not calling them a name but you know thinking through a, a response which is what you do in like a board meeting or something so it makes sense right. to me um but the facebook presence is there it allows people to to to, to really be educated and, and say their piece um I, I just couldn't do it anymore. It's it's interesting. I think a lot about Facebook, right? Because I mean, Facebook and and Google less so now with the cloud, but certainly Facebook and and all the apps they own, and the fact that it's the world's sixth or seventh biggest company. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's like a newspaper. And I'm pretty sure newspapers went out, as you said, who listens to the radio and who watches the newspaper. At some point, you would think that all the vitriol. Um, on Facebook, as an example, I'm not on Facebook for that exact reason. I went off Twitter because I found that if you were engaging with people because people didn't have to use their real name, they could say whatever they wanted to and not back up any statements and just like, you know, go after you personally every time they disagreed with you. I do agree that that's the moderator on LinkedIn and not to say that there aren't different people with different views, but generally you have to back up what you say because people, you know, they, they take note and the bigger your online presence, the bigger the people take note. So I like to see the discourse on, on LinkedIn. I like to see people generating good content. What, what are some examples of, of some content that you guys put out yourselves that, that can help educate people? Or what are some talking points that you would tell people that they could use in conversations with neighbors that maybe disagree with oil and gas development? Yeah, I mean, the, the stuff we're putting out, we'll, we'll put out fact sheets every once in a while. I mean, the things that I like to talk about are, are super pragmatic. So uh, during the opening round of uh, the opening salvo of testimony um, against oil and gas, Casey Becker introduced the Senate Bill 181. And I still remember this, that they went through this big dramatic deal. And then there, she had a, a doctor, a pediatrician next to her. And the pediatrician said something so anecdotal. She said at the end, you know, I just hope that with all this oil and gas development, there's not an increased case, uh, an influx or increased amount of cases of leukemia, right? So there's absolutely no correlation between any leukemia and oil production, everything else. It's actually the opposite. If you look, so so this she, this this pediatrician says this, which I found to be completely unethical and and whatever. But I heard that I'm like, why? Just just that anecdotal like. Right. Seed planting. Yeah, seed now, planting. Right, now all of a sudden, yeah. people are afraid of leukemia and oil and gas is going to cause leukemia. While I was in testimony, it took like six hours for me to get up. I I did my research. I went to the, the CDC and other sources and found that, you know, Colorado, Wyoming, Texas, New Mexico, and Utah have five of the six lowest cancer rates in the entire country. These are the oil producing states. Um, cancer rates and, and disease were more tied to diet than they are fossil fuel production right I, I do a ton of work in in the permian and delaware basins which has way closer proximity of oil production with way less regulation to people they're proud to have a pump jack in their yard and they're some of the health the healthiest people in all of texas and the, the country because they work hard they you know they, they there's a, a mix of diet and exercise there because of their work ethic yeah um those were the things that I set out to combat, and that's what Energy Strong. Energy Strong, what we're putting out is more just education, like, hey, um, this rulemaking's coming up. Here's what it's going to be talking about. If you need help with talking points, here's a few. Uh, here's the latest news on what's going on. Just kind of getting everything together and everybody, whether they're a, on a frack company or a, working in a refinery, whether they're a service provider working for an operator, they're in the same place to throw their two cents in. And then it's this educated kind of dialogue or or uh chain of of data so it's it's dispelling a ton i've learned a ton i mean just some of the safety initiatives of, of companies like great western and uh, uh others in colorado has been awesome i mean they're they're focused on the same th the, the crazy thing is both sides want the same thing right less impact um minimal emissions good quality of life but you would think that, you know, one one just wants to, to ban the very thing that gives them that. And uh, yeah, we were not very good as a society at trade offs. Right. And, and you, you mentioned earlier the Nancy Pelosi going to get her hair blown out 
and and that that somehow you can have a mask that matches all your clothes and you can go to a hair salon and you expect them to serve you at the price you used to pay while at the same time their capacity is one customer per and that this is somehow okay and to me if you're a leader you lead by example and if you're go you know you should have bad hair and bad makeup and like like this is suffer the you know and, and again yeah. it, it is amazing to me we we have some when uh, my wife and i about two years ago went over to to uh england and france uh for for a trip that had been delayed 10 years um that was the the part of the what the fuck is wrong with everybody else book i wrote and um i think the 10-year anniversary trip was delayed about 10 years because at the 10-year mark she probably didn't want to travel with me very much um, so anyway, we went over and there were some war, some war stickers in the war museum. And one of them was like, eat less bread. And one of them was don't take alcoholic drinks on Monday. And so there were like true sacrifices. There were trade-offs, eat less bread, drink less alcohol. And it was like part of this grander mission. Whereas I don't really feel like there's any trade-offs. There's like, we want you to wear a mask and we want you to socially distance and we don't want to open our schools and we want you to not fly and we want to have 50 percent businesses because we really don't know what we're doing and now as data has come out to show that we made the wrong decision we really can't say actually guys we were wrong just go back to your life and the last six months forget about that was a mistake sorry about that dave i mean we're on the exact same wavelength there uh they can't uh, no one would ever have any faith and vote for anybody again if they said, well, sorry, we ruined your lives, we were totally wrong, even though they were. I mean, our company develops all sorts of process models and even, even when we know almost every single variable, there's always a little bit that's wrong there and we have to own it and fix it. This was so far off. Uh, I, you know, ever said, listen to the expert. I was more right than the experts. I, I actually was talking to my circle. I was like, there won't be more than 200,000 people dead. It was totally anecdotal, but there was no way it was gonna be two million people our society just wouldn't allow for that type of thing it, you know and, and it was supposed to be an r not factor of three turns out it probably wasn't even one it, i mean everything was wrong and yet those were the experts if those were the experts in the oil and gas industry we'd, well, we'd be, be, be crucified we'd be crucified well yeah and we already are even though we're right most of the time i mean it's right. it's, it's a really bizarre paradigm we're in where government control you know, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's the the uh, the the pandemic, if you want to call it that, it's just it, it. They're not good at anything they do, and that's my my last line in my testimony that I gave to the COGCC was. We got come back to. What's that? No, I want to come back to that, but say, the last line, say it. Yeah, I mean, it was that we have engineers, scientists, and environmentalists here in this state. Let's put them to work, not politicians. I don't need Mike Foot and Casey Becker and. Um, Jared Polis and the others, all from Boulder, telling us that, you know, we're the ones polluting when, you know, that latest study from University of Michigan that shows the most emissions per household came from Boulder County in the entire country. Boulder County pollutes the worst. Yeah. It, is, I, it is amazing the disconnect between the consumption piece and the production piece. And we want to blame, we want to blame McDonald's for us being fat. We want to blame Coke for making kids fat. We don't want to blame the parents that feed their kids McDonald's or feed them Coke. And we don't want to blame the consumers that says, okay, you don't need to drive. If you love Tesla so much, go buy a Tesla. Well, I don't really want to spend that. I can't afford it. Okay, well, how about the fact that when you plug it in, it's fed by coal and gas and wind and, and solar. And it's made of plastic. And it's made of plastic. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me. Anyway, now I want to speak to the testimony because as you said, everyone was coughing and hacking up a lung and, and yelling you down. So if you have it, I would love, because I know it's a two or three minute speech, I would love for you to give your testimony on the Hot Take of the Day podcast so that everyone can hear it unadulterated and can hear the importance of the messaging that is happening in these public discourses and and help maybe motivate people in terms of telling a personal story and after you tell your personal story i will give some testimony as to why i think we need oil and gas so sure so i'm just going to read it verbatim what i had so under testimony you get two or three minutes and so you do you do kind of lose your train of thought but um 
my deal was this. I said that I, I was representing Energy Strong and myself, right? So um, I, everyone was talking about the difference between, you know, we don't need a one size fits all and this and that in terms of new rulemaking. But I put that I was, a, I was representing Energy Strong and myself. I'm a front range citizen and, uh, and uh, in, this, in this discussion, which is essentially Boulder versus the entire state. It's the way I see it. It, it looks like a, a Boulder, a few Boulder politicians are trying to control how whole state operates under one size fits all. So the, the three basic themes in my comments were, were to cover that fossil fuels were extremely safe and have, had, have made our lives better than at any time in human history, despite the anecdotal claims to the contrary. Two, that there is a massive health and safety risk from transitioning away from fossil fuels, which are unreliable for renewables, which are intermittent. And then uh, three was the economic risk that Senate Bill 181 posed. Uh, my testimony was as follows, that I love Colorado. I've been here my entire life, and despite the, our population growing exponentially, the air and water are cleaner today than they were in 1978, the year that I was born. That, those are EPA statistics. Um, overall, other than urban sprawl, the state is in much better shape than ever before in terms of the environment. So urban sprawl, like in my neighborhood down here in, in Sterling Ranch by Chatfield, you know, you got a gas line coming to every house now, whereas before there was just, you know, nice virgin environment. Uh, Colorado had been producing oil for over 100 years and has some of the lowest overall cancer rates while maintaining some of the best qualities of life in the nation. I get that people know, uh, I, I get that people wish that this world had a static climate, but it never has and it never will. The truth is that everyone on this call or in this testimony or in this meeting uses oil and natural gas because it makes their lives better. It protects us all from Colorado's natural climate, which has always been a dangerous place to live, whether it be extreme weather like blizzards or drought or heat or fires. Fossil fuels allow us to thrive here with tremendous confidence from turning on a sweet switch to heat and cool our homes to bringing us clean drinking water. Colorado is blessed to have outstanding local talent and an abundance of natural resources and has become the gold standard for safe and environmentally friendly oil and gas production. We do it better here than anyone else in the world. So for that, I'm an advocate of exporting our model of oil and gas production, transmission and refining globally, not banning it. In contrast, a handful of fringe Boulder politicians want to force our entire state to mirror California's failed energy policies under the guise of public health and safety. By copying California's energy policies in Colorado, the COGCC and others would be complicit in, complicit in creating higher energy prices, which create energy poverty. Two, it would create intermittent electric service that cannot meet the demand. Three, it would hamper economic growth. And four, it would leave a mountain of debt uh, Oil and gas is a huge part of the GDP in Colorado is currently sitting at over a $3 billion budget shortfall just this year. So all of these things are health and safety risks that are not being quantified in any of the discussions the COGC is having. Uh, California has, you know, everybody's read about it on the, uh, seen it on the news or read it in the paper, but California is experiencing blackouts when they need energy the most. Uh, those are because of misguided overregulation. Because of that, overregulation and a lot of their mandates that are anti-oil and gas. California now imports 60% of their oil. Most of that comes through the Strait of Hormuz. Imagine that, loading oil on a tanker in, in the Middle East and, and importing it and calling that green. More than a, a million Californians suffered blackouts a couple of weeks ago when they needed it the most. The California grid is the worst in the nation. California has five of the 10 worst cities when it comes to air quality. And that's that's the that that's the model that everybody wants because they just say California. It's a knee-jerk thing. Um, Elise Jones from, from a Boulder County commissioner was talking about how much pollution from Weld County was blowing into Boulder County, and that's when I discussed the University of Michigan uh, had had found that people living in Boulder County create more pollution from their homes than anywhere else in the entire country. So pollution isn't blowing into Boulder; they're generating it themselves and then villainizing others. Uh, so my, my final thoughts were that, you know, we can fear, fear monger all we want to the point where our children are terrified to leave their homes. But, but what concerns me is if it's 100 degrees outside or if there's a blizzard or a snowstorm, 
that I don't have the access to reliable energy to heat my home, to power my life, to travel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we have the engineer scientists and environmentalists in Colorado to continue to solve these problems. Let's put them to work and not let a few fringe politicians dictate our state's energy future. Love it. Love it. Yeah. And, and I mean, they're, they're all, they're all great points and, and it's sad. It's sad that, 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 that dialogue, you know, doesn't, doesn't exist. And, and so, you know, I had done a post yesterday and again, life is about trade-offs. And so, you know, I could work out more and, and very clearly I can tell from the camera, like you're jacked, you're jacked to the nines. And, and so like exercise and working out is a big part of your life, right? Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah. yeah. And, and so, and the trade-off you make is you have to probably eat less and, and devote time when you could be doing something else, another hobby. You have to get yourself to the gym at whether it's early in the morning or at noon or after work. And you're making exchanges in order for you to live healthier. You're having less time to do other things like hobbies. And to me, we, we take that in our normal life and we say, I understand that I can choose this or I can choose this. But somehow the conversation out there is we can have everything we want. We can have all the energy we want and it will be very, very cheap and it will cost nobody anything and taxes will be low and everyone will prosper. And we both know that that's just not, that's just not a thing. It's, it's. It's agonizing. I mean, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not third generation oil field. I mean, the the discussion you do hear a lot on the on the pro oil and gas, you know, especially from some of the county commissioners in in Western Colorado, is that oh, this is our, these are our jobs, these are our budgets. Those those are very important things. But I think for the normal person that's not in oil and gas, they don't care about oil and gas jobs just like they don't care about anything that's not really in their their ecosystem, right? So like if if uh, car sales are down because COVID, do I necessarily care and uh, lose sleep over car salesmen not meeting their quotas? No, I, I, I care about things that are bigger than that. My, my quality of life, my ability to travel, I'm a huge believer in pursuit of, you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, man. That's that's kind of my, my, my you know, what I follow in life. Pursuit of happiness is everything. If you want solar panel, hey, if you want to live without oil and gas, Go camping for a weekend. First thing you want to do when you get home is turn on the heat and turn jump in a hot shower. There is a huge, huge disconnect. People are being sold a bill of goods that does not exist, that we can abandon this ship. Fossil fuel power is like 85% of our lives, no matter what. To jump out of this ship into another one before it's built is asinine. As a business owner, as a leader of that business, I, I, I can't even – that's – Probably the most frustrating part for me i cannot get to a level where i can think yeah let's just go try something new even though we know i mean it, there's no possible way for it to work let's just jump over there and i think it was diana de Getz page when i read her her mission it said we're going to make this change and it's bold you know everybody uses the term bold we're going to make this bold change and the technology will catch up right there's like this leap leap of faith that no matter what entrepreneurs and, and technology are going to magically bridge a gap that, that isn't there. Right. I don't think they understand energy density. I don't think they understand how much uh, uh, energy that and one one gas and oil well in, in well County produces. Uh, I think Ryan Zorn from Clear Creek had done a study and he showed that one of their horizontal wells over a, a three-year period produced more power than every solar project across the front range in 30 years or something along those lines. That's, I'm paraphrasing, but it was it was on a magnitude that wasn't even fathomable, but people don't yeah. care. They, they just, if, if they make the decision to go solar and wind and ban fossil fuels here, Dave, if we ban fossil fuels here, what's going to happen? Same thing as California. The infrastructure, the pipeline's already in the ground. They're just going to import the oil from Saudi Arabia like we used to until we have an answer. Instead of, you know, the, the, the mindset is ban it here, import it, and we can pat ourselves on the back because we effectively outsource those outsource those emissions overseas the last point that i have a hard time here's where i think oil and gas can can do a little bit better in terms of make connecting some dots right you'll have hollywood uh ban bangladesh because of their uh a factory working conditions in a factory but they'll import oil from saudi arabia 
same regime that throws, you know, gay people off of roofs, that uh, treats women completely terrible. These are real things. They'll gladly import those products from Saudi Arabia, but uh, not not produce it here where we do it better and cleaner. Yeah. It, it, I can't understand how it's okay and, and that everybody's all right with importing this valuable product from from regimes that don't match our values. Well, if, if I were if I were to testify, and I think it ties to a lot of the points that you said, you know, I think I think the fulcrum of my of my testimony would be that every day when we wake up in the United States, we expect that we have reliable access to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And in all of those things, we choose to use energy. We turn our lights on. Right now with the school from home and work from home, we demand a high level of energy to be able to have the bandwidth and the storage capacity and the teaching capacity and the video capacity that you and I could have this conversation here. And so all forms of energy are good and all forms of energy need to grow because our population is growing. And so to me, I think that we need policies that protect the environment, which include number one emissions, which everyone is trying to stop. And so from an emission base, re regulating flaring, regulating tank emissions, allowing VRUs and other such things to be used in order to make our footprint as small as possible, but then acknowledging that it is a consumer choice to consume energy. And so for those Coloradans who don't want to have heat in the winter and cool in the summer, they have the option to not turn on their air conditioning. They have the option to not turn on their natural gas heating, you know, within their house. And so let consumers choose the energy that they wish to consume. If you want to allow electricity distribution to actually price, I'm going to pay this for wind and this for solar, and then allow consumers which source they would like and how much they would like to pay, that is what government should do. Government should provide the infrastructure to allow consumers to choose, and then consumers, not a minority, but every single consumer can choose. Should I buy an electric car? Should I install solar panels on my roof? Should I install wind farms in in off the grid and what is the most economic life fulfilling thing for me to have and provide direct access that's what i ask my government to do that's it that would be my testimony yeah why don't you give it where are you i just did come on come to the next cogcc meeting that's those are great points and it's it's to my point you know i i go focus back on boulder because this senate bill 101 is kind of spawned out of boulder and all the front loaded comments, <clears throat> excuse me, and testimony are all, you know, Steve Finberg and, and Casey Becker that sponsored these bills. And they just talk about how bad oil and gas is and um, everything else. And they're the, 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 the worst consumer of it, right? So since 85, I think 1985, Boulder's had a vision to be a renewables driven city. They don't produce hardly any power of any kind. Uh, they just consume it. They just consume it that others produce. And even their their wind power that they buy, along with, you know, I was riding a, a chairlift up Copper Mountain, it said powered by wind as the diesel motor pulls me up, you know. Uh, they, they buy these wind credits, which is totally, if I did my accounting the way wind credits were bought, I'd be in prison. But that Boulder County pushes this deal for the whole state to stop producing oil and gas and fracking's bad, you name it, that, that there's environmental racism happening because of a refinery that's been there since the 30s. Uh, people have moved in proximity to it yeah because it's the play the places are cheaper and it's cheaper it's like moving out by the airport it's cheaper yeah. out there because there's noise pollution yeah yeah and it's no secret to anybody but once people live there now all of a sudden you put this tag on there that it's it's got environmental justice environmental racism and that's those are the new things we're fighting in terms of it shifted from setbacks and zero emissions to now it's uh environmental justice and environmental racism um Boulder County's producing more pollution than anybody. And they just, they don't, they've got tons of open space. Put some solar panels on them. Put them, if there's no impact, put solar panels in all your open space or put wind turbines up. There's zero impact, right? I mean, those are the the, the dots that we need to draw. We need, to, we need to, to, to pull the mask off the people that are villainizing our industry and go after them. They're attacking us. I mean, make no mistake in, yeah. in testimony, I invite anybody that listens to this podcast 
to look at the COGCC website. Now there's Zoom calls. No one's meeting in person. So there's Zoom calls. You get called on. You know, you get a, a roster of who's talking. Your line, your line in place, and then they call on you. You can listen to the whole thing, and you listen to the first 20 minutes of testimony from anti-fossil fuel legislators, and you tell me that they don't want to put us out of business. I'll bet you my life savings that's what they're after. They, it's the guy, the 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 overarching deal is health and safety, and um, you know, uh, environment, right? So. It's, but it's all done under health and safety. So the 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 the, the coughing and stuff were, were they doing that over Zoom or was that a live? That no, was that, a live that was in that, that was in live test. In Zoom, they mute mute everybody. So okay. they, that, at least they at least they do that. Yeah. Now, what, yeah, so when is so true. so let's do this together. When is the next COGCC hearing that uh, they are taking testimony? Let me. I'll, I'll look that up here while we're talking and get back to you. Okay, I love it. So, so I'm going to let you look that up, and and I guess this is the call to action, right? And 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 what you've probably heard is 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 a level of frustration that that citizens uh, who who have a view, and and of course, there's many many people out there that understand and value oil and gas, both your career and your livelihood, but also your ability to commute your kids to their sports and your ability to heat your house in the winter, and 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 we all know that there are trade-offs and and 100 percent solar and wind and nuclear and thermal and natural gas and oil and coal and even biomass which is the most ridiculous thing but all of those things are important for the lifestyle that we have and so there is a philosophy of degrowth which is let's shrink let's go back to living in log cabins let's have less people let's have less impact and go back to the standard of living that existed in 1900 when in 1935 when social security was put in the average life expectancy of an american at that time was 61. and so our life expectancy has improved with the access to energy because we have more agriculture because we're more energy dense yeah. we are able to put cities together where we have more people with better livelihoods with better safety nets because of energy density so yeah, you're able you're able to produce more per acre all that stuff go back even further go to the, the roman era right life expectancy was 30. yeah our life expectancy and quality of life is better today than at any time in human history the life we have people even 100 years ago couldn't I spend a ton of time in the mountains riding to little towns like Creed, Creed, Colorado, and all these little mining towns, St. Elmo behind Mount Princeton. These people lived in one room shut shacks heated by whatever wood they could chop down with no quality of life. Yeah, uh, that was a hundred years ago. Be a hundred years ago. So, um, so that's a call to action. People need to get involved because if if they want to protect their way of life you might not want to take the time you might be busy with your families but these are important issues and we've seen in the riots we've seen in advocacy groups for for opposition to things it's very easy to get riled up about things you disagree with but it's hard to activate when you agree with something well uh, my call is that we need to do that so jack yeah. tell me when the next meeting is so the the hearings are active there's there's one today and tomorrow. Um, so pretty much uh, every day they're doing. So right now what's happening is the COGCC is, is engaged in rulemaking, right? And typically at the beginning of those, there's public comment before they kick off on, you know, you can talk about anything, but um, most people are stating their positions and trying to you know, use the democratic process to say, hey, um, I'm for oil and gas or I'm against it and this is why. But there's uh, if you go to the COGCC website, banner on the left-hand side, there's hearings today. Uh, so Tuesday through Thursday, Thursday are um, the mission change rulemakings, and then that uh, resumes Friday and Tuesday. So you can go there. You can click on the links on the COG. Energy Strong is also working on a comprehensive calendar that has all hearings, events that are oil and gas, so everybody can go there. But um, go to the COGCC website. It's right on the left-hand side. Uh, upcoming events. And those are there, but for the next um, couple of months, it's going to be almost daily because they're, they've now, now's when's important. It doesn't matter any legislature that, that's passed. Now they're making the rules that the COGCC, which is when you know their mission changed from fostering mineral development in Colorado to regulating it right. in accordance with with environmental and health and safety standards. So. It, it's a monumental flip. The rules that are being made, they're going to affect every person in the oil and gas industry. 
probably not only in Colorado. This this will probably set a precedent. Um, and so, how do you sign? Happen. How do you sign up to give testimony? What's that? How do you sign up to give testimony? Uh, you just go to the website. There's a link to click, and it says sign up. And then they, you know, it's a two or three fields on your name, your company, and your email address. Uh, if you get if if it gets full, uh, they close it out, which it typically fills up pretty quick. Okay. Um, but yeah, you'll, it's pretty pretty user friendly. Good. Well, well, I encourage everyone to follow all of the energy strong organizations across all the states. I think that this is a really important issue and hopefully we've illuminated a lot of the topics just in terms of how important your voice is. And so I encourage everyone to get involved in whatever way, shape or form that they deem is appropriate and responsible. I encourage you to continue to have dialogue with your neighbors because you don't have to agree with them on everything, but you should probably not cough and tell them to fuck Go off. On during the conversation because that's not progressing as a society and as we look at the society today i ask is this the society you want to leave for your kids and i would argue definitively not we need more dialogue and we need more people like jack so jack thanks so much for joining us today on the hot take of the day podcast we're going to pump this out as a special edition uh asap yep. so no merger people... no no merger talk come on man we got two minutes left yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's talk mergers. mergers. What do you want to talk about? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Let's talk about let's talk about summit. So, what are you doing now when you're not doing energy strong? That was a great merger that you announced when you yeah. merged summit engineering. Tell, tell us about time, that merger. Timely. So, so still involved with with Sergeant Lundy, the acquiring firm, uh, running the you know they acquired us as basically an oil and gas business unit. So right now we're we're still focusing on our up mid and downstream work of you know lowering emissions, continuous monitoring of facilities, things like that, making them safer and better. And we're also doing a lot of gas utility work, stuff stuff with uh, natural gas utilities that deliver the, the natural gas to homes distribution. Great, and and um, what, what one piece of advice would you give yourself to your younger self that would help maybe prepare you better for where you are today? If you could go back and meet 20 year old Jack. Invest in Bitcoin or Tesla. Um, <laughs> uh, Probably would be to, um, you know, pretty pretty spry kid and suppress my ego fat. Once once I abandoned my ego and and uh, really was set out to help people, right? Build the company to help create jobs and do things for something other than just something I could I could uh, hang on a wall. Money became the byproduct. So it would have been to to network harder and just find my focus a little earlier on. I love that. I, I always say money follows good people. And if you focus on the process, the outcome will be success. If you focus on the the outcome in terms of success, it's you're very rarely going to find it. So I think that's really, yeah. really good advice. Work, work harder. Work, work harder. harder. Yeah. Well, I love that. Jack, thank you so Bye. much for joining us. Yeah. And um, Pleasure. look forward to our continued conversations. Until next time, everyone be safe, be good. Have a great day. And bye for now.